and welcome to my basics presentation for Edexcel Combined Science Chemistry Paper 4. This presentation contains basic information, so it will get you up to about a grade 5 or 6, but it won't get you further than that. Do not just listen to this presentation. Make sure you're taking notes or making mind maps or drawing diagrams. Um, if you don't understand a bit, pause it, rewind, re-listen to bits, and make sure you're practicing exam questions as well. So starting with topics one and two, which is states of matter and separated mixtures. To begin with, if we look at some basic definitions, uh, we need to think about atoms. Atoms are normally uh, represented during uh, single circles like these. Uh, different colours represent different types of atom. And an atom is the smallest stable particle of matter. Atoms can join together to form molecules. A molecule is a particle made of two or more atoms bonded together. And they can be different types of atom or they can be the same types of atom that doesn't matter um, but they're two or more atoms bonded together an element is a substance made from only one type of atom so this is an element because it's only made from black atoms this is an element because it's only made from red atoms compounds are substances made from two or more types of atom bonded together Bonded just means joined. So if we look here, this is a compound because we've got red atoms and black atoms. This is a compound because we've got white atoms and black atoms. So two different types bonded together. Notice the different structures. So the one on the uh, the one on the left here is made of a lattice. This one is made of individual molecules, but they're both compounds because they've both got more than one type of atom. And lastly, we've got mixtures. A mixture is a substance made from two or more elements or compounds that are mixed but not bonded so if you look at this one on the uh, left here we've got one two three four different types of substance all mixed together but not bonded on the right we've got three types of substance all mixed together but again not bonded now, states of matter. The state of matter just describes whether something is solid, liquid or gas. And we need to understand the difference between the arrangement and motion of the particles and about how uh, they change from one state to another. So if we look at solid, first of all, that's this one here. Uh, you can see the particles are arranged in these kind of nice regular rows. And if you look very closely, you can see they're vibrating slightly. So they're not moving around from point to point, but vibrating around a fixed point. Liquids, such as here, we've got uh, the particles are still touching, but now they're in no order at all. They're sort of random all over the place uh, and they are moving past each other. And in gas, in gas, like we've got here, the particles are now no longer touching they're completely randomly spaced, uh, the particles are widely spaced, uh, and um, the particles should be moving very fast. It doesn't show that clearly on this diagram. Now, in terms of change of state, um, going from, if we start with solid, going from solid to uh, liquid, we've got melting, and liquid back to solid is freezing. Going from liquid to gas is evaporation or boiling, either we get the mark, and going from gas back to liquid is condensation. Going from gas to solid is called deposition. And going from solid back to gas is called sublimation. Now, if you take a substance, a solid substance, and you heat it and measure the temperature every few seconds, you get a graph like this one on the right, uh, bottom right hand corner. So the temperature, you can see it goes up and then it levels out. It goes up and then it levels out. Now, these level sections are state changes. So in this first section, that is the solid melting. And in the second section, flat section, that is the liquid boiling. Now, during that time when it's boiling, the and uh, when it's melting, what's happening is that the energy, rather than going into increasing the temperature, is going into breaking the weak intermolecular forces between the uh, molecules, the particles that are holding them together. Solubility. This describes whether something can dissolve or not. So a substance can be either soluble 
or insoluble. To say something is soluble means it dissolves. And when something dissolves, it means the particles spread out evenly throughout the liquid. So if we look at um, our, our sugar here, we call that a solute. The solute is the thing that's going to be dissolved. And that's going to go into the water here. The water is a solvent. That is the liquid that something dissolves in. And you can see here, the yellow sugar has been spread evenly throughout the whole of our solution. So the whole of our liquid, and we call that a solution. So a solution is a mixture of a solute dissolved in a solvent. Now that mixture bit is important because mixtures can be separated. So what we can do with the solution is get the solute back out and end up with our solute and solvent as we started. Insoluble just means that a substance does not dissolve. Some substances are soluble in some solvents, but not in others. To separate uh, mixtures, we need to think about their properties. So the first two approaches we're going to look at are filtration and crystallization. So filtration separates insoluble solids from liquids. So we're thinking something like a mixture of, say, sand and water uh, or water and, say, some insoluble metal oxide or something. And all you do is you get your mixture and you pour it into a filter paper. Now the filter paper, if you look at the microscopic structure, has lots of tiny little holes in it, okay? And those tiny little holes are small enough for the liquid to pass through, but uh, the holes are too small for the solid particles to, to fall through. So the solid remains behind here. We call the solid the residue, and we call the liquid that filters through is called the filtrate. Crystallization separates the solids from a solution. So the idea here is that we're going to heat the solution until all the liquid evaporates and the solid remains behind. But just look at the way we do it. We don't heat the we don't heat the um, solution directly because if we do that, what happens is it will boil so vigorously that we get all these little bits that will just spit out and which is a quite dangerous because they're very hot and b means we lose the solid that we're trying to collect. So instead, what we do is we heat it indirectly. So we get this um, uh, beaker full of water and we heat the beaker until the water boils and the steam then rises up and it heats the beaker from below which allows the uh, solution to get hot without boiling so it evaporates quickly but it doesn't boil so it doesn't spit little bits out and once we've reduced the volume of the of the uh, solution by enough we won't continue heating it anymore. What we'll do then is we'll just remove it from the heat and leave it somewhere warm to evaporate over a few days to give us some nice crystals. Distillation is used to separate out liquids from mixtures. So there's simple distillation here and fractional distillation. Simple distillation allows us to collect a liquid from a solution with a solid. So for example, you might have um, a uh, solution of seawater and you want to collect the water from that seawater. It works like this. So you uh, heat your liquid in say a round bottom flask like that and what you do is you pass the vapours through this thing here. This thing here is called a condenser and what happens in a condenser is we put cold water in there and the water comes out there and that cold water provides a nice cool surface for all these vapours that are rising up when they hit that cold surface, they condense. You can see they form these droplets of liquid and the droplets of liquid come out and we collect them at the end. Fractional distillation is used to separate mixtures of two different liquids together. So for example, let's imagine you had a mixture of uh, ethanol and water. This would allow you to collect one pot of ethanol and one pot of water. And it has the same uh, basic setup as simple distillation with the addition of a fractionating column um, and the fractionating column what it does is it allows for a sort of better temperature gradient so it makes sure that you get a better separation between these two different liquids note that in both types of distillation we also have a thermometer a thermometer is useful because it lets us monitor the uh, temperature which tells us something about what's being produced so if for example we're collecting liquid in the flask here, then the temperature here will read 100 degrees Celsius, which is the boiling point of water. If we were collecting ethanol in the flask here, the temperature here would read 78 degrees Celsius, because that is the boiling point of ethanol. 
Paper chromatography is used to separate mixtures, mostly of liquids, but sometimes of, uh, of other solutions too. But it's about doing it on a small scale. This isn't about collecting bulk amounts of stuff, but more about separating mixtures uh, just to check what is in them. And it works like this. So you have your chromatography paper. That's the, the paper here. We call the paper the stationary phase. So stationary phase. And then we have some kind of solvent, which we call the mobile phase. Now, what we do then is on our stationary phase, we draw a line in pencil uh, about two centimetres from the bottom. Um, and it has to be in pencil because pencil is insoluble. The graphite is insoluble, so it won't move up the paper. Um, and we place a spot of a sample that we want to separate on that pencil line. Then we put the paper um, into some solvent. And as you can see on the on the uh, on the little gif, the solvent soaks up the paper. And as it does so, the substances in the spot move up as well. OK, but the distance they move up depends on how soluble they are. So things that are more soluble, like the red spot, move further than things that are less soluble, like the black spot. So this takes our original sample and separates it out into multiple different spots with each spot representing a different substance. What we can do is we can measure a quantity called RF. So RF is given here, it stands for retardation factor. And that is the distance moved by the compound divided by the distance moved by the solvent. So it's gonna give a number between one and zero, one being the maximum, zero being the lowest. And it is super simple. You just measure that distance there, the distance traveled by the um, solvent and the distance traveled by your sample. And you divide one by the other. Uh, so that you can see it happening here. So six divided by 10, we give you an RF of 0.6. We did a core practical with this. So we investigated uh, ways to separate ink. One of them was a simple distillation. So we didn't use all the fancy condenser and things. We used a, a setup that does the same job. So we just had a delivery tube coming out of a test tube and going into a beaker of ice. And so we put some ink in the bottom here. It was black ink, I think was the one that we used. Um, so we put some black ink in the flask, we heated it, and passed the vapours into that ice bath and the ice condensed the vapours back to a liquid. We also did chromatography on some different coloured uh, pens. So we drew a pencil line near the bottom, we placed, the inks, placed an ink spot on the pencil line, we put the paper in some water, making sure the water was below the level of the ink spot. And then we waited for the water to rise up the paper and we measured the distances that the ink spots traveled and calculated the RFs. This is quite a messy practical. You don't get nice clear spots. If you look at that, you get something like these sort of big smudges, but it's still enough to see the basic principle. We can still see the colors separating out. Topics three to four are on atomic structure on the P. So now we'll look at the structure of atoms and a reminder that an atom is the smallest stable particle of matter. Atoms are made of particles that are smaller than that called subatomic particles. And there are three of them, protons, neutrons, and electrons. So to start with a proton, protons have a mass of one and a charge of plus one. We find them in the nucleus of an atom uh, and the number of them is given by the atomic number, more on that later. We have neutrons. Neutrons have a mass of one and a charge of zero. That's why they're called neutrons, because they are neutral. They are also found in the nucleus and they have an atomic, uh, the number of them rather, is given by the atomic mass, take away the atomic number. And lastly, we've got electrons. Electrons have a mass of one over 1835. So that's a really tiny mass, a charge of minus one. Uh, we find them in shells orbiting the nucleus and they're given by the atomic number. And if we look at the actual structure here, so we can see that we've got this structure of atoms where the protons and the neutrons are in this middle section, that is the nucleus. And then we've got our electrons orbiting around uh, in these shells here, okay? Now this diagram is not drawn to scale. To scale, the nucleus is one ten thousandth the diameter of the electron shells. So to put that into perspective, if the if you picture the London eye, um, the, the the ring of the London eye is the shells and the nucleus would be the size of a pea at the centre of that. The periodic table uh, is used to organise all the elements that we know and it is arranged in order of increasing atomic number. So you can see atomic number one there, two, three, four and so on. Now, 
on the periodic table we have these columns. So we've got the first one, second one and so on. We call the columns groups. So we've got group one, group two, big gap. Don't worry about this big gap here. We can sort of ignore those for now. Then we have group three, group four, group five and so on. Note here hydrogen doesn't really belong in any particular group because hydrogen is fairly unique as an element. Um, we also have periods. Now periods are the rows on the periodic table. Hydrogen doesn't have a group but it does have a period. It is in the first period. So period one, period two and so on. There are also other things you should know. Um, for example where the metals and non-metals are found. So if we start here and draw a stepped line down, okay, like that, zigzag, 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 okay, everything over here, these are the non-metals, and everything over on this side is metals, and you can see there are a lot more metals than non-metals. So if we look at the uh, the cells that are on the periodic table, so each one of these boxes, we'll see we've got these two numbers. So for example, this, this element here is beryllium, and we've got a nine and a four. And that nine and the four, the atomic mass is the name we give to that number nine. So that is the top number, uh, and that is the number of protons and neutrons combined together. So if we want to calculate the number of neutrons in the, uh, in the atom, we just do the atomic mass take away the atomic number. So in this case, it's 9 minus 4 makes 5 neutrons. The bottom number is called the atomic number. Okay, And that gives us the number of protons. So the atomic number here is 4, so beryllium has 4 protons. It also tells us the number of electrons, so beryllium also has 4 electrons. And just one last little note, look at the way the symbol is written. Okay, It starts with a capital most some symbols have a second letter some don't if it has a second letter the second letter must be a lower case now electron configuration this describes the way that electrons are organized in shells around an atom so there's a very specific structure to it and we have this these layers of shells you can see for example here lithium has got one two uh, shells. Chlorine here has got one, two, three shells. Now, the first shell can hold up to two electrons. The second shell can hold up to eight electrons. And the third shell can also hold up to eight electrons. That is not strictly true. That's a white lie we teach you. And you'll learn more about that at A level should you go further with this. Now, look at this in practice. So let's take lithium here. Lithium Lithium has uh, an atomic number of three. That means it's got three electrons. So two of them go into the first shell. The first shell is now full. So you get go on to the next shell now and put the remaining electron in there. We can write that electron configuration as two dot one, like that. Okay. Um, if we look at chlorine here, chlorine has uh, the symbol Cl. 35.5 and 17 so it's got 17 electrons so two of them go in the first shell okay then we get eight in the second shell then we still have another seven left over so seven go into that last shell so we can write that as 2.8.7 okay now there is a way to check this the periodic table tells us the electron configuration of an atom because the group number is the number of electrons in the outer shell and the period number is the number of shells the atoms got so if we look at lithium here lithium okay is in the first group okay and the second period so it's got two shells because it's in the second period and one electron in the outer shell because it's in the first group. If we look at chlorine, chlorine is here. That's in the third period. And it's in group seven. Okay. So third period means it has three shells. One, two, three. And uh, group seven means it has seven electrons in the outer shell. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, isotopes are 
different versions of an element with the same atomic number and different atomic mass. That is also the same as saying they have the same number of protons but different numbers of neutrons. Okay, so for example, there are three isotopes of carbon, carbon 12, carbon 13 and carbon 14. That number that we, uh, we, we use when we write uh, these isotopes, that is just the atomic mass. Okay, so carbon 12, carbon 13, carbon 14, because they're all carbons, they've all got the same atomic number, which means they've all got six protons and six electrons. And you can see that here, six protons, six protons, six protons. What's different is the atomic mass, which means they've got different numbers of neutrons. So carbon 12 has got 12 minus six to give you six neutrons. Carbon 13 has got 13 minus six to give you seven neutrons. And carbon 14 has got 14 minus six, which is eight neutrons. Chemically, these things are the same. They do all the same reactions. It is their physical properties that tend to be slightly different. Topics five to seven, bonding and structure. This covers ionic bonding, covalent bonding and metallic bonding. Ionic bonding. Bonding is about how atoms join together. And in ionic bonding, it's to do with the formation of ions. Now, an ion is an atom with a positive or negative charge, and they're formed by gaining or losing electrons. We have cations. They are positive ions formed by losing electrons, and it is metals that form those. We also have anions, which are negative ions formed by gaining electrons, and those are formed by non-metals. To remember which way is which, just remember that cations are positive. Now, an ionic bond is the electrostatic attraction between a positive and a negative ion. So it's between a cation and an anion. And they form by electrons being transferred from a metal atom to a non-metal atom, leaving a metal as a cation and the non-metal as an anion. And we can see that happening in this example here. So if we look at lithium, which is a metal, uh, and fluorine, which is a non-metal. Lithium's one electron in its outer shell gets transferred over to fluorine. That leaves lithium with just two electrons in one shell, which is the full shell, because it's the first shell. And it means that fluorine now has eight electrons in its sh outer shell, so that's full as well. Lithium has this plus charge here. Fluorine has this minus charge here, so there's an electrostatic force between the two, and now they've formed an ionic bond to make lithium fluoride. Now, ionic compounds form a what's called a lattice structure. Now, this here is a lattice structure. That is a repeating three-dimensional pattern of, in this case, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, and it repeats up and down, left and right and in and out in three dimensions and if you think about a single grain of salt for example this pattern is repeated many many billions of times in each direction now um, these things have a high melting point that's because in order to um, you know when something's melted it means the ions are free to move around and that requires you to break these very strong electrostatic forces between the ions now, these things do not conduct electricity when they are solid. That's because when they're solid, these ions cannot move. You know, they're locked tightly in place. However, if you melt them or dissolve them to make them liquid, then ionic compounds do conduct electricity because the ions would then be free to move around. Covalent bonding. This is bonding involving shared pairs of electrons okay so a covalent bond is a shared pair of electrons um, to go into detail is, is, is it take, takes a long time with this so i think there's a real case here for just memorizing each of these structures so these are the ones the syllabus requires you to know hydrogen hydrogen sorry, hydrogen hydrogen chloride oxygen carbon dioxide and methane and 
Uh, if you look at just some of the key ideas, these are drawn as overlapping circles. So each we just draw the outer shed electrons and each circle represents an outer shell. Um, and the bond itself is the uh, is the overlapping is the pair of electrons in the overlapping section. So that blue bit that I've just circled, that is uh, a covalent bond. And you can see that each atom ends up with a full outer shell. So um, the electrons in this pair count for both atoms. So they'll orbit this, this atom here. They'll also orbit this atom here like that. Okay. Um, with hydrogen chloride, same kind of thing, but with a hydrogen and chlorine, you can see chlorine's outer shell, shell ends up full because it has eight electrons. Hydrogen's outer shell ends up full because it has two electrons. Remember, hydrogen just has two electrons in its outer shell when it's completely full. Um, oxygen and carbon dioxide, you'll notice they're a little more complicated because they've got two pairs of electrons in their overlapping sections. We call that a double bond. There is also such a thing as a triple bond, but you do not need to know about it. So, oh dear, my computer can't write. Uh, it's called a double bond. Okay. And then we've got methane here, probably the most complicated one you need to know about. Um, you sometimes also see in exam questions, they'll draw you, ask you for tetrafluoromethane, which looks similar to, to, um, to methane, but with fluorines arranged around the outside like this. So we have F, 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 F. It's similar in as much as we've got uh, the same number of dots and crosses, but the thing to remember is to fill in the outer shells on our fluorine to make sure that each fluorine ends up with eight electrons in the outer shell. But other, other than that, it's very similar to methane. Now, some substances with covalent bonds form what are called a simple molecular structure. A simple molecular structure is one made of molecules. Now, molecule is a particle made of a few atoms covalently bonded together. So that's normally somewhere between about two and about 20 atoms bonded together. Um, uh, so you can see that as an example here is water. So this is made, this is H2O. You can see the little gray ones are the hydrogens and the red ones are the oxygens. And a water molecule is just that. It's just those three atoms bonded together. Now, these things have low melting points. The reason for that is because when they're in the solid or liquid form, they're held together by these weak forces of attraction that I'm just circling here called intermolecular forces. Now, those forces are weak, so you don't need much energy to break them, which is why they have low melting points. They do not conduct electricity because they have no electrons that are free to move. The alternative for covalent compounds is a giant molecular structure. Now, a giant molecular structure is a repeating three dimensional pattern of atoms joined by covalent bonds. So this is quite like the ionic lattice formed by ionic compounds. So it's just a repeating pattern. Um, and some examples of things that form this kind of structure, silicon dioxide, diamond and graphite. Now what you can hear, see here is silicon uh, dioxide. So the reds are oxygens and the black ones are silicons. Okay. And uh, the formula of this is SiO2, silicon dioxide. And this pattern just repeats over and over again. So you can see that each oxygen has two bonds to a silicon and each silicon has four bonds to an oxygen. And that pattern just repeats again and again and again. Now these have high melting points because to allow these atoms to start moving past each other, you need to break all of these strong covalent bonds. Every one of those bonds needs to break to melt it. And that requires a lot of energy because they are strong bonds. They do not conduct electricity because there are no electrons that are free to move. The one exception to that is graphite. Allotropes of carbon. Now, an allotrope is a different structural form of the same element. So um, carbon exists in four different allotropes. We have diamond, graphite, graphene and fullerenes. Now, these are all carbon. Um, uh, they're all elements, so they're only made out of carbon atoms. But as you can see from the diagrams, they've all got different structures. So, uh, and that gives them quite different properties. So if we look at diamond, uh, diamond 
Uh, every carbon in diamond is attached to four other carbons in a giant molecular pattern. Okay. Um, now, because every carbon is bonded to four other carbons by these strong covalent bonds, it means that forces um, get kind of transmitted through the structure really easily, which makes diamond the hardest, uh, sort of strongest substance uh, known to man. It has a very high melting point because um, to uh, melt diamond, you need to break all these strong covalent bonds, which requires a lot of energy. And it doesn't conduct electricity because there are no electrons that are free to move. All the electrons are locked up in those covalent bonds. Now, moving on to graphite. In graphite, this is the main um, allotrope of carbon um, and the most stable allotrope of carbon. So in this one, what we have is these sheets um, where every carbon is bonded to three other carbons in this sort of honeycomb hexagonal pattern. Okay? And graphite is just made of layers and layers and layers of these hexagonal sheets stacked on top of each other. Now, because the carbons are bonded to three other carbons, that means they've all got one electron that is kind of spare and not doing anything. And those electrons um, are delocalized between the sheets. So you can imagine kind of between the layers, you've got these clouds of electrons just moving freely, which means that graphite is the only material, um, uh, giant covalent material that can conduct electricity because it's got those delocalized electrons that are free to move. The other thing with graphite is that it's a good um, conductor, so um, a good lubricant, because these layers are not strongly attracted to each other, so they slip past each other really easily. Uh, in fact, when you write on a, um, a piece of paper with a pencil, the pencil contains graphite, and you're just rubbing layers of graphite off and leaving them on the paper. Now, graphene. Again, in graphene, every single carbon is bonded to three others in this honeycomb structure. But the difference between graphene and graphite is that graphene is just a single layer. And that gives it some really interesting properties. It's an excellent conductor. It's extremely strong for its thickness. Um, and it has all sorts of interesting properties. But um, graphene is quite a new material. Um, so we're still working on the science with that one. And the last one is fullerenes. Now, fullerenes are a range of related molecules. They can be ball shaped like this one, um, uh, or they can be tube shaped like this one. Again, they involve carbons bonded to three other carbons um, and they can conduct electricity and they have, again, a range of different interesting properties. Um, now, polymers. Polymers are a type of covalent uh, compound that form very, very large molecules. But importantly, they're large molecules made from many smaller ones joined together. You can imagine these a bit like a necklace made of beads. Each bead is very small, but the necklace could be very big because it, they're all joined together. Okay. Now, we call the small molecules that get joined together, they're called monomers, Okay. and they join together to form polymers. You can see here, each monomer is small, but the overall polymer is big because it's made of lots of them joined together. And we have lots of examples of this in nature. So the proteins that uh, we get from our meat and dairy, uh, they are made from amino acid monomers joined together. The starch that we find in you know, rice and bread and potatoes and whatever is made from lots of glucose monomers joined together. So these polymers are really important uh, compounds. Last kind of bonding we need to think about is metallic bonding. Metallic bonding is the bonding we see in metals. And the important thing here is that in a metal, the outer shell electrons get delocalized. Now, this word here, delocalized, means that the electrons in the outer shells aren't bound to one atom, but are free to move around many. So if we take this electron here in a normal substance, that electron will just spend its entire life just whizzing around and around and around the same old boring atom. Okay, But in a metal, that electron's delocalized, which means it can just move wherever it likes. It just goes on a magical mystery tour around all of the atoms. Okay. Now that is going to be important when we think about the properties. Okay. So this leaves each of the metal atoms as a positive ion because it's lost its outer shell electrons. Okay. So a metallic bond then is the attraction 
between a lattice of metal ions and this cloud of delocalized electrons that's whizzing about everywhere. Okay. Now, really importantly, metals conduct electricity. And the reason why is because those electrons are free to move. You can see that happening here. You can see in this little GIF, the, the electrons can just move uh, from negative towards positive. So that's why metals conduct electricity. Topic nine, mass calculations. This looks at calculating relative formula mass, um, looks at empirical formulas, calculating percentage composition by mass, reacting masses, and mole calculations. To calculate MR, which is the relative formula mass of a substance, we're going to add up the masses of all of the atoms it contains. So if we think about a three-step process, we're going to start by constructing the calculation, uh, where we're going to write the symbol of each atom and multiply by the number of them present and put plus signs in between. Then we're going to substitute with the uh, relative atomic masses. Um, and the final thing we're going to do is to complete the actual sum. So an example of this, if we were calculating MR for magnesium nitrate, we're going to construct it properly first of all. So we're going to say MR and then in brackets MgNO32, like that, okay, equals 1 times magnesium plus 2 times nitrogen because although there's 1 nitrogen, the nitrogen is in the brackets and there's two outside the brackets. So there's two nitrogens in total, so times two nitrogen, so two times M for that. Okay. Um, and then we're going to add that to six oxygens because there are three oxygens here, but because there's two of the brackets, we're going to have three times two to make six oxygens. Okay. The next thing it says is to substitute with the relative atomic masses. This will normally be given to you in the question, but if it's not, you can look it up on the periodic table. So for magnesium, that is 24. So 1 times 24 plus 2 times 14 for nitrogen plus 6 times 16 for oxygen. Okay. And if you just stick that all into the calculator in one long string, you will end up with an answer of 1 four eight so the mr for magnesium nitrate is 148 an empirical formula is the molecular formula of a compound re-expressed as a ratio in its simplest terms and to do this we're going to follow three steps so the first thing is to identify the highest common factor of the numbers in the formula then divide each number by the highest common factor and then rewrite the formula so we'll start with uh, this one example here, N2H4, which is hydrazine. Okay. Um, so N2H4, the highest common factor of 2 and 4 is 2, because both 2 and 4 can be divided by 2. Okay. So then I divide each number by the highest common factor. So my nitrogen is going to be 2 divided by 2 equals 1. And for hydrogen, it will be 4 divided by 2 equals 2. So I'm going to have my formula is going to be NH2. Because there was 1N, I don't put a number there. I just leave it as N. A more difficult one this time. So this here is glucose. Okay. So glucose is C6H12O6. The highest common factor of 6, 12 and 6 is 6, because each of those numbers can be divided by 6. So the highest common factor equals 6. So for carbon, I'm going to do 6 divided by 6 equals 1. For hydrogen, I'm going to do 12 divided by 6 equals 2. And for oxygen, I'm going to do 6 divided by 6 equals uh, 1. So my empirical formula, rewriting that formula, is going to be C... H2O. And again, just a reminder that because the C and the O are both ones, we don't put a number in the equation. Okay. Now, sometimes, as in this case, the highest common factor of your things is one. So um, the only number that two, one, and four can be divided by is one. So if the highest common factor equals 1, then your empirical formula 
and your molecular formula are going to be the same thing. Percentage composition by mass uh, questions are asking us what percentage of the mass of um, a compound is coming from one particular element. So in this case, it's asking what is the percentage by mass of iron in iron three oxide? Okay. To do this, we are going to first of all multiply the mass, the relative atomic mass of the element by the number of them in the formula. There are two ions in the formula for iron oxide. So we're going to multiply the mass of iron by two. Then we're going to divide that by the relative mass of the overall formula and then times by 100 to make percent. So let's see how this looks in practice. So we're going to say the percentage of Fe equals the first thing is to do the mass of the element multiplied by the number in the formula. So the mass of iron is 56. That's been given in the question, but you might need to find it from the periodic table. So we're going to do 56 times by 2 because we've got two ions in the formula, times by two. Okay. We're going to divide that by the relative formula mass of iron oxide, Fe2O3. So let's just work that out down here. So we're going to say uh, relative formula mass of Fe2O3 equals two times iron, two times Fe, plus three times oxygen, three times 16. Okay. Um, let me get my working script. Three times oxygen. Okay. So iron has a mass of 56. So that's going to be two times 56. Uh, oxygen has a mass of 16. So we're going to see three times 16. Add that together. We get 160. Okay. So we're dividing our amount of iron by the MR. So we're going to have 56 times 2 divided by 160. We're going to times that by 100 to make it into percent. And if we do that, we end up with 70% as our final answer. Now, sometimes you will need to determine the empirical formula of a compound from experimental data. For example, it says uh, two grams of a sample of a compound is found to contain 1.5 grams of carbon, with the rest being hydrogen, determine the empirical formula. So to do this, we're going to write out the symbols as a ratio. Okay. Um, and this ratio presentation is going to really help us, so it's important to stick with it. Then we're going to write in the masses that are given, divide each mass by the relative atomic mass of the element, then divide each answer by the smallest answer, and then we, get, we finally can write the empirical formula. So let's start by writing out the symbols as a ratio. So in this case, um, we're talking about carbon and hydrogen. So the symbols for that are C for carbon, and H for hydrogen. We're just going to put a dot dot in the middle to remind us it's a ratio. Okay. Then write in the masses that we are given. So step two now. Carbon's easy. It tells us it's 1.5 grams. Okay. But for hydrogen, it's a little more complicated because it doesn't tell us the number. It just says the rest of it is hydrogen. So if two grams was the whole sample and 1.5 grams is carbon, the hydrogen is going to be 2.0 minus 1.5 which equals 0.5. Sometimes the questions will give you um, both the masses straight up and sometimes you will have to work one out. So we've gone for a more difficult one here just so you can see how that would work. Um, then it says to divide each mass by the relative atomic mass of the element. So we're dividing by AR. Now we don't have the relative atomic masses in the question. So let's look on the periodic table. And if you do that, you'll find that for carbon it is 12. So we're going to divide 1.5 by 12. And for hydrogen, we will find that it the answer is uh, is one. Okay, so we're going to divide hydrogen by one. So 1.5 divided by 12 is going to give us 0.125, and 0.5 divided by one is going to give us 0.5. Okay. Now it says divide each answer by the smallest answer. The smallest answer is 0.125. So if we divide that by 0.125, we're going to get 1. And if we divide 0.5 by 0.125, we will get 4. So what that tells us is that uh, in this compound, for every 1 carbon, there are 
four hydrants. So Aaron Pilger formula becomes C H four. Reacting masses questions are ones that ask us, you know, if you've got five grams of substance A, how much of substance B will you make? Or if you've got uh, 10 grams of substance B, how much of substance A will react with it? Or if you want to make 50 grams of substance B, how much of substance A do you need? Okay, but they all follow the same pattern. So in this one, we're going to ask ourselves what mass of water, H2O, can be produced from 64 grams of oxygen according to the following equation. Okay, and uh, we're going to start out by writing out the information from the question under the relevant symbols in the equation. So it's telling us what mass of water. So water is one of our relevant things. We don't know the mass of water because we're being asked it. So we're just going to leave that as X because that is an unknown. But for oxygen, we do know something. It says 64 grams. So we're going to put 64 for water. OK, everything else can be ignored. We don't need to think about hydrogen at all because it's not mentioned in the question. So we can just scribble it out and pretend it's not there. Next thing is it says calculate the MR of each of the relevant formulas okay, and multiply by the coefficient in the equation. The coefficient is the number in front of a compound in an equation. So um, these twos, for example. OK, so we're going to have for oxygen, our coefficient is one. So we're going to find one times the MR of oxygen, OK, which is going to equal one times. Oxygen uh, is uh, has a relative atomic mass of 16, so we're going to have one times two lots of oxygen. So one times two times 16. And that is going to just be 32 in total. Okay. Over here on the water side, we're going to want two lots of the MR of water. So two times the MR of H2O. So if we actually work out that relative formula, so two times hydrogen has got two, water's got two hydrogens, so two times H and one oxygen, one times O. OK, so that is two times hydrogen has a mass of one, so two times one. Oxygen has a mass of 16, so one times 16. So that ends up coming to 36. OK, now the clever bit is that if you look at the way this is written, OK, 64 is over 32 and x is over 36. Now, reacting masses problems are actually ratio problems. And the way this is written is now presented as a ratio problem with an unknown to solve. So we're going to turn this into a fraction with 64 and 32 as one half of the fraction. So 64 over 32 is going to equal x our unknown over 36 okay and now we can just rearrange to solve for x so this rearranges to x equals 64 over 32 okay times by 36 and if we just stick that into a calculator that becomes 72 grams is our units and so there is our final answer to calculate the amount of a chemical in moles remember first of all that the number of moles of a substance is just the quantity of chemicals so moles is the unit of measurement for chemical substances so um, we're going to have a four-step process so we're going to first of all calculate the relative mass of the compound then we're going to write out the moles equation then we're going to substitute in our values and then we're going to solve it. So nice and easy. Looks more complicated than it is. So in this question, what quantity in moles is present in 69 grams of ethanol, which is C2H5OH? So it says start off by calculating MR for the compound. So we're going to do MR of ethanol, C2H5OH, okay, equals two times carbon plus six times hydrogen because look we've got five there but also that one there so six times hydrogen 
plus 1 times oxygen, because this is just 1 oxygen. Okay. So carbon has a relative mass of 12. It's not given in the question here, but we can find it from the periodic table. So we're going to say 2 times 12 plus. Hydrogen has a mass of 1, so 6 times 1. And oxygen has a mass of 16, so 1 times 16. And that comes to 46 in total. Okay. Now we're going to write out our moles equation. So moles equals mass over molar mass. Okay. So we've just found the molar mass because that is the same as the relative mass. So we, we're dividing by 46. Okay. We've got uh, 69 grams up here was the mass given in the equation. So we're going to put 69 there. And if we do that, it comes to 1.5 and the units is mole. So that is our final answer. Topic 13, groups in the periodic table in which we look at alkali metals, halogens and the noble gases. Group 1, also known as the alkali metals. We're going to look at the first three alkali metals, which are lithium, sodium and potassium. Now, the alkali metals are interesting. They're all quite soft metals. Um, and they get softer as you go down. So um, potassium is the softest of these metals. Um, this uh, lithium is the hardest, but you can still cut it with a knife quite easily. Um, and also, more importantly, they get more reactive as you go down the group. So lithium is least reactive and uh, potassium is most reactive. And if you go further down the group, they continue getting even more reactive than potassium. The main reaction we need to know uh, is the reaction with uh, water. So alkali metals and water make alkali metal hydroxides and hydrogen. Um, and the reaction sort of follows the same format for all of them. So lithium and water makes lithium hydroxide and hydrogen, potassium and water makes potassium hydroxide and hydrogen, and so on. And if you want to know the um, symbol equation for that, it's it's the same uh, for all of them. So it's we'll put an M for the metal. So metal um, plus H2O is going to make um, MOH plus H2. We're going to balance that with twos all over the place. So two there, two there, and two there. Um, and to actually get the equation for the actual metals themselves, just substitute M with Li or Na or K or whatever the metal is. Okay. Now, we also need to know the observations. And you can see the observations for sodium uh, up here. Uh, we'll come back to that in a second. Now, with lithium, it bubbles and it floats on the water. With sodium, it because it's more reactive, it melts and then also bubbles and floats. And it zips about the surface. You can, you can see that happening uh, here. You can see the sodium melting into a ball and sort of moving around the surface of the water there. Um, and the last one is potassium, which, um, as well as melting, bubbling, floating and zipping around, it also catches fire, producing this lilac flame. Now, we need to be able to explain why uh, potassium is more reactive than lithium, where well, they get more reactive as we go down, and it's to do with the way that these things react. So alkali metals all react by losing the electrons, that lone electron in their outer shell, okay, to form a positive ion. Now in lithium, because that ion is quite, that outer electron is quite close to the uh, to the nucleus, it's very strongly attracted to the nucleus, so it's pretty hard to remove it. Now in potassium. The electron in the outer shell is much further away from the nucleus, so it's much it much easier to remove it because it's less uh, attracted to the nucleus, and for that reason, it's more reactive because the electron is less attracted to the nucleus because it is further away. Group seven is the halogens. There are three we need to know about, which is chlorine Cl2, bromine Br2, and iodine I2. There is also fluorine F2 above chlorine. Um, but we don't need to know about it in so much detail. Now, chlorine is a green gas, uh, bromine is a reddy brown liquid, and iodine is a silvery grey solid. So look at the way they go gas, liquid, solid. That's because the melting point and the boiling point are increasing as we go down the group. Okay. We'll also find that the reactivity increases going up the group. So chlorine is more reactive and iodine is less reactive. We need to understand the reaction with uh, with metals, and it's very straightforward. A halogen plus a metal makes a metal halide. 
and the equation for that is really simple let's call the halogen x we're going to make it x2 because they're all you know um, cl2 br2 i2 so we call it x2 plus m for metal we'll make it two of them makes two lots of mx so it's a really straightforward reaction um, with uh, with hydrogen they react in a similar way okay so this time halogen and hydrogen is going to make a hydrogen halide um, so we're going to have x2 for our halogen again h2 for hydrogen and it's going to make two hx's okay just notice this term here on the names halide halide just means a halogen minus ion so we're talking chloride is cl minus bromide is br minus and iodide is i minus because they all form negative ions by gaining electrons when they react um, and the last little thing we need to know is that to test for chlorine um, you get some damp blue litmus paper you can see the blue litmus paper here damp blue litmus paper briefly turns red and then it bleaches white and you can see the white bleaching there so that's a test showing that um, chlorine has been detected now in terms of the reactivity of the halogens and fluorine is most reactive then chlorine then bromine then iodine and the reason why is because of the way they react so as we said on the last slide when they react they form halide ions so fluoride chloride bromide and iodide now these are negative ions so to make a fluoride ion f minus we're going to gain an extra electron from a metal okay to make a chloride ion we're going to a cl minus we're going to gain an extra electron from some of them. just draw that in as a dot okay now importantly because fluorine is a smaller atom with fewer shells the electron you're gaining is more strongly attracted to the fluorine atom which makes the atom more reactive in chlorine that electron that is attracted is sitting in a shell that's further away from the nucleus so it is less strongly attracted to the nucleus of chlorine which makes chlorine that bit less reactive than fluorine and bromine is less reactive than and then chlorine iodine is less reactive than bromine all because of this way that um, the atoms get bigger so the electrons are further away and less attracted now one class of reactions that the halogens do is called displacement reactions and in these what we find is that a more reactive halogen can displace a less reactive halide to make a new halide like that and a new halogen like that okay so fluorine in this case can displace bromine from sodium bromide because it's more reactive and it will end up making sodium fluoride and bromine the opposite reaction doesn't happen because bromine is less reactive than fluorine so can't displace it so we can see that fluorine displaces chloride bromide and iodide chlorine displaces bromide and iodide bromine displaces iodide and iodine displaces nothing because it's not more reactive than any of them and we can do an experiment to do this and you can see that in this gif here so in this gif what we've got here uh, in the columns we've got solutions of halide salts okay so um, sodium chloride sodium bromide and sodium iodide and we we put a little bit of them in each one of these little wells okay in the rows we're going to add solutions of different halogens so the halogens go in rows okay and what we find is that if we add um, iodine to each of our different things you get no color changes because iodine can't displace anything if we add bromine okay you'll see that this one and this one change uh, stay the same but this one gets a color change because bromine is more reactive than iodine and can displace it and then if we do the same with chlorine it won't do anything with chloride but it will displace bromine and iodine so we get color changes with both of those group zero are the noble gases now the most important fact about the noble gases is they're very unreactive there's another word we can use we can say they are inert Okay, inert means they don't react with anything now the four we need to know of are helium neon argon and krypton h e n e a r and k r now the reason they don't react is down to their electron configurations if you look at each of their electronic structures you can see that all of them have full shells of electrons helium has two electrons remember it's only got one shell so it only needs two 
Um, Neon's got eight electrons in its outer shell, and Argon's also got eight electrons in its outer shell. So those outer shells are full. They have no need to gain or lose any electrons, and so they're going to be completely unreactive. That unreactive or that lack of reactivity explains most of their uses. So, for example, helium is used in airships for two reasons, partly because it's got a very low density, so it floats, but also because it doesn't react. We used to use hydrogen in airships, which also has a low density, but it has the unfortunate habit of exploding, which was uh, very unfortunate for the passengers of those airships. Neon, we use it and we use it in um, strip lights like this because it glows nice bright red when you pass electricity through it. And Krypton, for a similar reason, gives it a bright white flash um, when you pass electricity through it. So it's used in uh, as flashes for professional photography. And lastly, Argon is used in wine. So what you do is you fill the airspace in a wine bottle with the Argon. And that means there's no oxygen in, trapped inside the bottle. So the um, alcohol doesn't get oxidised because if there is oxygen, the, the alcohol can be oxidised to vinegar, which is not what most people want in their wine. Topics 14 to 15, rates of reaction and energy changes. So we look at rates of reaction and what they are and how you study them. And then we'll look at endothermic and exothermic reactions. So rates of reaction. The rate of a chemical reaction is the amount of product formed per second. And to calculate the rate of a reaction, really easy. We just do what, however long the reaction takes, and then the rate is one divided by that time. Okay. Now, to monitor the rate of a reaction, we need to be able to see some kind of change. So often, if a reaction produces gas, we can collect that gas in a gas syringe. That's what's being shown up here. Um, similarly, you could collect the gas in, a, um, in an upturned measuring cylinder full of water. That's what we do in one of the core practicals we'll see in a second. Um, similarly with gas, because of the way gas bubbles out of a container, that means that over time when a reaction produces gas, it actually gets lighter because um, although mass is being conserved still, the gas is going into the air so we can't measure its mass easily. So the mass reading on a balance would go down. Okay, so what we can do, we do the reaction on a balance, we time it, and every 30 seconds we record the mass, we can monitor the change uh, as the reaction is uh, continuing. And the last method we have is called the obscured cross technique. The idea of this, this only works with reactions that go cloudy. Okay, now with a reaction that goes cloudy, you do it in your conical flask, and you put the conical flask on top of a big black X that is drawn on a piece of paper. And as the, um, as the uh, reaction gets cloudier and cloudier, that cross will gradually start to disappear and you won't be able to see through it. And eventually it will get so cloudy that the cross will be completely gone and you won't be able to see anything. And at that point you stop the timer. Now, if we look at rates of reaction um, and how they change over time, the rate of reaction is fastest at the beginning. And the reason for that is simply that's when you've got the most product, the most reactants around. So it's most likely there'll be reactions, which makes the whole thing uh, faster. And then it slows down over time. Now you can see that if you monitor on a graph, the gradient of the graph is the rate of the reaction. You can see the graph start off really steep and they end up uh, uh, much shallower. So in this steep bit here, that's the reaction going quickly. In the shallow bit here, that's the reaction going slowly. And you can to find out the rate of reaction at any given point by drawing a tangent that is a straight line that just touches the graph okay and you find out its gradient to find out the gradient you measure the change in y and divide it by the change in x and that will give you the gradient and you can use that to find the rate of reaction at any given point okay now it's important to understand the difference between how fast a reaction goes and how fast it goes so a reaction may go faster than another one, but could produce the same amount of product in the end. So if we look at this graph here, the um, red line is telling us what happens or how fast the reaction goes if we have five grams of large marble chips, so large bits of marble. And you see the reaction goes quite slowly and it gradually levels out and whatever. Okay? Um, equally, we could use small marble chips. Now, with small five grams of small marble chips, with small marble chips, the reaction will go faster, which is why the line is steeper. But because you've still got the same amount of marble, the reaction will go just as fast, so it will finish up 
at the same place as with the large chips. It just gets there more quickly. Now, the rate of chemical reactions is controlled by something called collision theory. Now, collision theory tells us that in order for two particles to react with each other, first of all, they must collide. They must actually physically hit. And secondly, they must collide with enough energy. That's called the activation energy. Okay. So if we want to increase the rate of a reaction, we want to make sure there are more collisions and that those collisions have more energy so that more of them have that activation energy. Okay. So if we increase the concentration of a substance, you know, say an acid or something, that means there'll be more particles around. So there'll be more collisions. So then there'll be more reactions. And note that sequence of events, more particles, more collisions, more reactions. If we increase the pressure of a gas that's reacting, okay, that means the particles are going to be closer together. So again, there are going to be more collisions and more reactions. And note the similarity with the last one, more collisions leading to more reactions. If we increase the surface area, okay, now just so you're clear, this is showing how we increase the surface area. So if we look at this first one, okay, with one great big lump here, all these particles on the inside of that big lump of green, okay, the red acid particles simply can't get to them because they're stuck inside. They're protected by the ones by the green particles outside. Okay. Whereas if we take that same big piece and break it up into lots of smaller lumps, you can see there are very few particles that are that aren't on the edge. So that one there isn't on the edge. Um, that one there isn't on the edge, that one there, that one there. But other than that, all the particles are on the edge, so they can collide with the red acid particles. So what that's going to mean is, with increased surface area, there are going to be more exposed particles, so there'll be more collisions, so there'll be more reactions. So that sequence of more collisions, more reactions is happening in all three of the things we've looked at so far. Now with temperature, it's a bit more complicated. And we need to understand what happens with temperature. So if you look in this box here, you can see that at a hotter temperature, the particles are moving around really quickly. Okay? And at a colder temperature, the particles are moving much more slowly. Now, moving more quickly means two things. Firstly, it means there are going to be more collisions. But also it means those collisions are going to be more energetic. More of them will have this activation energy that we've seen is so important. Okay? So both more collisions and more energetic collisions mean there are going to be more reactions. So temperature has a really big effect on increasing the rate of a reaction. We did a core practical to look at this. So we did, there were two parts to it. First part was to look at how does surface area affect the rate of a reaction. So we set up the apparatus and it was something like this. So this, this apparatus here um, uses the gas bubbles through this tube. That tube is called a delivery tube, okay? So the gas passes through the delivery tube and is bubbled into this upturned measuring cylinder full of water. This is called collecting gas over water. So in the measuring in the uh, conical flask, we've got 50 centimeters cubed of um, hydrochloric acid. We've got five grams of marble chips and we place them in there, put the bung on so everything's sealed and we start the timer. And we record the volume of gas every 30 seconds uh, until it stops reacting. And then what we do is we repeat that with five grams of large marble chips. And we can also repeat it with five grams of powder as well. Again, recording how much gas is collected every 30 seconds. And what we found with this one was that the smaller the marble chips, the faster the reaction went because you had a bigger surface area. So there were more collisions and more reactions. We also use something called the obscured cross technique to study how temperature affects the rate of reaction. So what we did here was we placed uh, 50 centimeters cubed of sodium thiosulfate in a beaker and five centimeters cubed of dilute hydrochloric acid in a test tube. And we put them both separately in a water bath at 30 degrees Celsius. There's a mistake there, isn't there? There should be a little degree sign. 30 degrees Celsius and we left it for five minutes. Okay. Whilst we're doing that, we drew a black cross on a piece of paper like this. Okay. Now, once everything had got to temperature, we mixed our two solutions and started the timer. Now, over time, as the reaction gets cloudier and cloudier, that black, red, or red cross in this case, starts to disappear. And eventually, it gets so cloudy, we can't see the cross at all. And that's when we stop the timer. And then we repeated this with five different temperatures. 
and we calculated the rate by doing 1 divided by the time and we found that at the hottest temperature we got the fastest rate. Chemical reactions can be classed as exothermic or endothermic. Exothermic reactions release energy, which means they get hot. And endothermic reactions absorb energy, which means they get cold. Um, the reason why we have these differences is to do with making and breaking chemical bonds. Breaking chemical bonds requires energy, absorbs energy, whereas making chemical bonds releases energy. So in an exothermic reaction, we break weak chemical bonds and we make strong ones and we can see that happening here on this reaction profile so on this reaction profile we've got r for reactants here and p for products and we see that it goes up as like it did on the previous slide and that there represents the activation energy okay um the reason the energy goes up is because at this point on the upslope we're breaking weak chemical bonds and then we get out a lot more energy on the downslope by making strong bonds. So overall, the reaction is exothermic. It's released this energy here because more energy was released making strong bonds than was used to break weak bonds. On the endothermic one, the opposite thing happens. So again, we have our reactants and we have our products. Okay, Now, a lot of energy is absorbed to break strong bonds and only a small amount of energy is released when you make some new weak bonds. So more energy is required than is used. So the overall energy actually increases. So this thing has to absorb energy to make that happen, which is why an endothermic reaction gets colder. Now to measure whether the reaction is endothermic or exothermic, it's really simple. We do the reaction in an insulated container like this. So normally a polystyrene beaker with a, cup on, with a, a lid on top. And we measure the temperature before and after with a thermometer and that is really important because we've got to measure a change and you can only measure a change with two measurements so before and after um, and if the temperature goes up then it was an exothermic reaction if the temperature goes down then it was an endothermic reaction making and breaking bonds we've just seen on the previous slide that breaking chemical bonds absorbs energy so it is endothermic whereas making chemical bonds releases energy, which means it is exothermic. Now, at higher tier, we need to be able to use this idea to calculate the energy change involved in reactions. And to do this, we depend on something called the bond energy, which is the strength of a chemical bond in kilojoules per mole. Now, you don't need to memorize any of these. You'll be given them in the exam if you need to use them. The calculation we're going to do is really straightforward. It's going to be the sum of the product bonds minus the sum of the reactant bonds and to work it out 
we need to look at a diagram like this where we can see all the bonds involved in our reaction. So as I said, it is the product bonds minus the reactant bonds. So all we do is just add them up. So if we do the product ones first, okay, if we start with CH, we've got one, two, three, four, five CH bonds. So we can do five times CH. Add that to this one CC bond, so CC, and then there's one CCL bond, so CCL, and there's also one HCL bond, so we're going to add an HCL. Okay, and then we look at our uh, reactants. We're going to take those away. So in our reactants, we're going to have one, two, three, four, five, six CH bonds. So we're going to say six times CH. We're also going to add that to one CC bond, so plus CC. Um, and then uh, lastly, we've got a CCL bond, so plus. Oh, I've got that wrong. So plus one CCL bond. And if we substitute in the actual numbers that are given the equation, we'll add up all of these and take it away from all of those and that will be give us our overall result and if that number is negative then the reaction is ex n is exothermic and if the number is positive then the reaction is endothermic topic 16 fuels in which we look at hydrocarbons crude oil combustion and cracking so a hydrocarbon is a compound containing only hydrogen and carbon atoms this word only is super important. So if we look at these two things here, okay, these are both hydrocarbons because they've only got carbons and hydrogens in them. This top one is methane. This one here is called benzene. This thing here is not a hydrocarbon because although it's got hydrogens and carbons, it's also got that oxygen there. And remember, it's only hydrogen and carbon. So that is not a hydrocarbon. Now, hydrocarbons are found mainly in crude oil which is this thick black or brown sticky liquid that is drilled uh, out of the ground from uh, oil wells and things like that now it's used for two main things firstly as a fuel it's a really good fuel very versatile releases lots and lots of energy but it releases carbon dioxide which is causing global warming and also they're non-renewable we are running out of them and the second thing is it's used as a feedstock for chemicals so lots of the chemicals we meet in our everyday lives you know plastics and um, medications and things they're all produced using uh, chemicals that have come from crude oil crude oil is a mixture of many different hydrocarbons and the mixture itself isn't particularly useful we want to separate it out and use each of the separate things in the mixture on its own and to do that we use fractional distillation which is what is shown here which separates things according to their boiling point now first of all the crude oil is passed through a heater which boils nearly everything that's in there and then those hot gases move up the fractionating column and as they move up they cool down and eventually they cool down and they reach their um, boiling point they condense at that boiling point and will turn from a gas back to a liquid and things like uh, diesel they have a fairly high boiling point so they will cool down pretty quickly and they'll come out of the fractionating column there other things like petrol have to rise further before they get cool enough to condense and they might come out of the fractionated column at a higher level and some things never get cool enough to condense and come out of the fractionated column right at the very top in the form of gases now we call each one of these different um, things that comes out of the fractionating column is called a fraction okay and the fractions have differing properties based on the um, their structure so for example they have different lengths of molecules um, some of them are harder and easier to burn some of them have different boiling points and they have different viscosity or stickiness okay now if we look at the fractions their names we've got gases petrol kerosene diesel fuel oil and bitumen and you can see that goes in order from top to bottom so the gases come out of the top then we have petrol then we have kerosene which is known as jet fuel then diesel then um, fuel oil and then the bitumen now the gases at the top have the shortest molecules the bitumen at the bottom has the longest molecules so those molecules get longer as we go down the fractionating column 
the ease of ignition decreases. LPG gases will um, ignite with a spark. Bitumen will burn, but it's very difficult to make it do that. Their boiling points increase. So gases uh, coming out the top are, um, as it suggests, a gas, whereas bitumen is this is this very thick, sticky, almost solid. Okay, and also their viscosity increases. So gases and petrol they're very runny, and the things at the bottom are very thick and sticky. The alkanes are a group of hydrocarbons that are mostly used as fuels. And they've all got this same general formula, CnH2m plus 2. So what that means is that for every carbon, to find the number of hydrogens, you multiply it by 2 and you add 2. So our three simplest um, alkanes are these ones here. And you need to memorise these ones. I've put two more there as well, just for interest. But it's these three you need to know. That is methane, ethane, and propane. Now, methane has one carbon. Ethane has two carbons. And propane has three carbons. So if we start with methane, to work out the number of carbons, you do 2n plus 2. So if n is 1, 2 times 2 plus 2 gives you 4. So we've got the formula CH4. And you can see the structure here. It is one carbon surrounded by four hydrogens. In ethane, the um, number of carbons is two. So we've got C2. Okay. Now, to work out the number of hydrogens, 2N plus 2. So 2 times 2 plus 2 gives us 6. So we get six hydrogens. And this time you can see the two carbons are bonded together. Okay. And the hydrogens are arranged around the outside. And last we have propane. Now we've got three carbons. So the number of hydrants is two times three plus two gives us eight hydrants. Again, we join the carbons together in a long chain and we arrange the eight hydrants around the outside like that. Now, the alkanes are an example of what is called a homologous series. This is a family of closely related chemical compounds that have the same general formula but they increase or they differ by CH2 each time. Okay, So if we think about going from methane to ethane, we've gained one more carbon and two more hydrogens, i.e. CH2. If we go from ethane to propane, we've gained one more carbon and two more hydrogens, another CH2. Now, homologous series are important because what we find is their chemistry and their physical properties are very, very similar but we see a gradual increase as the number of carbons increases. So, for example, if we look at the boiling temperature of the alkanes, as the number of carbons along the bottom increases, you see that boiling temperature gradually going up as well. Um, and there are many other properties that follow that similar kind of pattern. Combustion is burning. Okay? And when we burn something, we are reacting it with oxygen. There are two types of combustion, complete and incomplete. Now, complete combustion happens when there is enough oxygen. Whereas incomplete combustion happens when there is not enough oxygen. Now, to be really clear, complete combustion is the one that we want. Firstly, because it releases more energy, okay? but also because the products are less harmful. So our word equation for complete combustion is just this. Fuel plus oxygen makes carbon dioxide and water. Now, the carbon dioxide is harmful in terms of global warming, but it's not toxic in as much as if we breathe it in, it's not going to kill us uh, uh, straight away. Now, it's important to compare that to incomplete combustion because incomplete combustion, um, there are two problems with it. Firstly, it produces less energy. Okay. And secondly, it produces something called carbon monoxide, which is toxic. And we'll come on to that in a second. Um, so with incomplete combustion, we have fuel and less oxygen, so insufficient oxygen. And we end up making a mixture of products depending on exactly how much oxygen is present. So we can get some carbon monoxide. Okay. That is CO. Um, some carbon that is also known as soot. And we can get carbon dioxide, which we know already is CO2, and water, 
H2O. Now we can't produce a balanced equation for this because um, it's difficult to know um, exactly how much oxygen. So we're going to get a, a different mixture uh, of products depending on exactly how much oxygen there is. Now, as I said, the problems with this are twofold. Firstly, it makes less energy. Secondly, it makes this carbon monoxide. And carbon monoxide is a highly, highly toxic gas. It prevents our blood from carrying oxygen, um, which means that um, we, we essentially kind of suffocate. Um, and the, the really scary thing is that by the time you realise that you're being poisoned with carbon monoxide, um, you've often got so little energy that you can't actually do anything about it. You just sort of drift off. Um, the soot is also a problem. Um, soot is this sort of black unburnt carbon and first of all it kind of sticks to buildings and it blackens them and makes them dirty and that's responsible for the kind of grey colour of a lot of cities um, but also it can cause respiratory problems so if you if you live in an area where there's lots of soot in the air you're more likely to have asthma and other kinds of lung condition the soot is also an issue in terms of flue pipes these are the these are the, sort of the little chimneys as it were that go to your boiler in your home if that gets blocked by soot it can prevent a good oxygen flow to your boiler which can mean it starts um, doing incomplete combustion producing carbon monoxide and and people die from this every year from carbon monoxide caused by these blocked flue pipes air pollution we'll be looking at two different types of air pollution so air pollution caused by sulfur dioxide air pollution caused by nitrogen oxides okay now sulfur dioxide comes from burning coal and the reason why is because coal contains small amounts of sulfur as an impurity so when you burn the coal you also burn the sulfur so the sulfur reacts with oxygen to make a gas called sulfur dioxide now the sulfur dioxide goes up into the uh, atmosphere and eventually it um, uh, goes into clouds and in those clouds it reacts with water to make sulfurous acid which reacts with oxygen to make sulfuric acid H 2SO4. Now, the sulfuric acid comes back down to the ground in the form of acid rain. Now, acid rain is any rain with a pH of less than 5.2. Acid rain isn't sort of crazy acid. It's not like you'd be harmed by it uh, if you were caught in a shower of acid rain. But it has longer term effects on the natural environment and the built environment as well. So you can see here that forest has been poisoned by the effects of acid rain and, and acid rain you know will also poison rivers and uh, and lakes meaning that fewer animals can live in them that's effects on their natural environment but also on the built environment if you look at this statue here okay look at all the detail in that face and compare it to a few years later when um, the detail on that face has been corroded by uh, the effect of acid rain over many years nitrogen oxides have a similar effect now nitrogen oxides come from the high temperatures inside internal combustion engines that's your normal car and van engines now the nitrogen oxides can also produce acid rain and they can produce this thing smog this is the kind of air pollution you often see uh, on on tv that kind of horrible cloudy nastiness that you see in big cities too often and that um, causes serious health problems to those that are living there Cracking. Cracking is about breaking long chain hydrocarbons into smaller ones. Now, why would you do that? You might ask. It's because there is a bigger demand for these shorter hydrocarbons and there is a smaller demand for the um, for the longer ones. So you can turn these longer, less useful hydrocarbons into shorter, more useful ones. And the way we do it is really easy. What you do is you get your um, uh, hydrocarbon and you heat it and you pass the hot vapors over an aluminium oxide catalyst and you can see that being done here so that there is our aluminium oxide catalyst and there is our um, alkane and it gets heated and the vapors pass over that hot catalyst and that causes it to what we say crack now cracking breaks a long alkane into another alkane and an alkene that's something with a carbon carbon double bond so we have these carbon carbon double bonds in our alkenes for example octane can be broken down into hexane and ethene so um just note the uh, formula for this so we've got c8h18 okay make c6h14 and c2h4 note that 
the total number of carbons on the right is 8 because we started with 8 carbons. The total number of hydrogens on the right, 14 plus 4, is 18 because we started with 18 hydrogens. So if you have this in an exam question, just, just look at the total numbers of carbons and hydrogens and make sure that you've got the same on the left and on the right. And here we can see what's happening to uh, in that cracking in more detail. So you can see here is the shorter alkane you've made and the alkene with its carbon-carbon double bond. Hydrogen is not currently a major fuel, but there's good reason to think that it might become so in the future. So could hydrogen be the fuel of the future? Well, if it did, it could be good because burning hydrogen produces no carbon dioxide, which means it doesn't lead to global warming. Because when you burn the hydrogen, hydrogen and oxygen simply makes water. Um, and also we can use hydrogen in what's called a fuel cell. A fuel cell is a kind of a type of battery that uses a fuel. So it doesn't run out as long as you keep on adding more fuel to it. Uh, and they're much more efficient. Um, and they, you can release a lot more electricity than that from that than you would just by burning the fuel in the normal way. However, there are some really big downsides. Where do you get your hydrogen from? So depending on how you produce your hydrogen, you can end up making carbon dioxide at that point instead. So this way, it, it means that although using the, hyd the hydrogen releases no carbon dioxide, if producing it does, then you've just moved the problem. You haven't solved the problem. However, if you produce hydrogen from renewable energy sources like you know wind turbines and stuff like that, then you don't produce carbon dioxide. So hydrogen can be clean, provided um, it comes from a source that doesn't release carbon dioxide. Another big problem is that there is little infrastructure um, for cars to start using hydrogen. You would need hydrogen fuel pumps at petrol stations around the country. And at the moment, that just isn't the case. And it would cost many billions of pounds to upgrade the nation's petrol pumps to do that. And the last thing is it's difficult to store hydrogen. Hydrogen is an explosive gas, um, so we have to be very, very careful with it. So the technology has to be a lot more advanced compared to petrol cars. Topic 17, the atmosphere, in which we look at the early atmosphere, how the atmosphere has changed, and then climate change, the most pressing problem facing us. The early atmosphere. The modern atmosphere is 78% uh, nitrogen, 21% um, oxygen, and a few other bits and pieces. But it was very different um, in the Earth's early history. We're talking four billion years ago. First of all, we think it was mostly carbon dioxide. And we think that for two reasons. Firstly, because volcanoes nowadays produce large amounts of carbon dioxide. And we know that back in the very early history of the Earth, um, there were a lot more volcanoes. We also um, find that if we look at similar planets to ours, so other rocky planets in the solar system like Mars and Venus, their atmospheres contain large amounts of carbon dioxide as well. And so it's, it's kind of reasonable to think that if those planets are quite like ours, it's reasonable to think their atmosphere would be quite like ours as well. Now, we also know that the atmosphere would have had lots and lots of water vapour. And that's because it was simply too hot for liquid water to exist. So all the water that is now in the oceans would have been in the atmosphere. And then as the Earth cooled, um, that water vapour would have condensed to form the oceans. But that would have taken uh, a, a very long period of time for that to happen. We also know that there was no oxygen. And the reason we know that is because if we look at some of the very oldest uh, rocks that we find, they contain minerals, for example, something called pyrite, okay, that simply cannot form in the presence of oxygen. So the only way to um, for them to form would be if there was no oxygen. Um, however, there are some people that say that actually maybe the atmosphere was mostly nitrogen. And the, the reason some people think that is because if we look at say Saturn's moon Titan, Titan's atmosphere now is 98% nitrogen. But some people think that is less likely because Titan is quite different to the Earth. Titan is largely an icy world rather than a rocky world. So we're probably more likely to have been carbon dioxide because uh, we're more similar to Mars and Venus than we are to Titan. Now over time the atmosphere changed and as I as I said the atmosphere now contains roughly 21% oxygen and 78% uh, nitrogen and then small amounts of other gases like a bit less than 1% argon 
uh, very small amounts of carbon dioxide, methane and water vapour and other things. Now, the atmosphere changed for a couple of big reasons and the, the single biggest change is that carbon dioxide levels decreased and that happened for two main things reasons. Firstly, the um, oceans. Now, two things happened in the oceans. Firstly, the oceans dissolved carbon dioxide, which took it out of the atmosphere. Okay. Second thing is the role of sea creatures. Now, many, many sea creatures make their shells from dissolved carbon dioxide and they turn it into uh, calcium carbonate. Okay. Now, when they die, those creatures' bodies sink to the sea floor and gradually become rock over, over many millions of years, which means that that carbon dioxide gets locked up in the form of rock. So once it's dissolved in the atmosphere, it's kind of more or less, so it's dissolved in the ocean, the carbon dioxide is more or less permanently out of circulation. The other thing that happened to, to change the atmosphere is um, photosynthesis. Now photosynthesis um, first began in something called cyanobacteria and then continued in plants. And it does two things. Firstly, photosynthesis uses up carbon dioxide, so the levels of, or the concentration of carbon dioxide decreases. But also, photosynthesis produces oxygen, so the concentration of oxygen increases. So photosynthesis has, has this massive kind of double effect, removing carbon dioxide and increasing oxygen. The modern atmosphere. Now, as we said, 78% nitrogen, 21-ish percent oxygen, just less than 1% argon, and a few other gases uh, as well, including carbon dioxide. Now, that carbon dioxide is important because it, along with methane and water vapour, are what we call greenhouse gases. Okay? Now, greenhouse gases are responsible for the greenhouse effect. And essentially what happens in the greenhouse effect is these gases trap the sun's heat and they warm the planet warm the planet up and they keep the planet about 35 or so degrees warmer than uh, would be the case without them. Now that's the difference between the planet having an average temperature of say 14 degrees Celsius and an average of about minus 20 degrees Celsius which would be too cold for life to exist. So the greenhouse effect is a good thing. However, human activities such as um, uh, farming, uh, and transport are uh, increasing the amount of methane and increasing the amount of carbon dioxide and that is causing the greenhouse effect to get stronger um, and that is leading to global warming so the greenhouse effect is a good thing the problem is that we're making it stronger by our by our activities because we're releasing lots of these greenhouse gases so the greenhouse effect is now getting too strong which is causing global warming and leading to the climate emergency how do we know this? Well, we've got lots of evidence. Um, firstly, if we look in ice cores, so we're looking at um, great big chunks of ice that we're digging up from um, the ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland. And we can see from those the way that the temperature and the carbon dioxide levels track each other very closely over time. So if we look at this graph here, um, the red line is the carbon dioxide and the blue line is the temperature. And you can see that they follow each other. And we know that it's the carbon dioxide that causes the temperature change but also if we look at our own temperature records if we look at satellite data all of these three things together are all painting this very clear picture that the temperature is increasing that it's caused by an increased greenhouse effect that it is our fault and that we do need to do something about it so what is climate change and what are the effects of climate change so climate change um, and global warming we're talking largely about increased temperatures okay but actually that has other effects as well. So um, that changes patterns of rainfall, it changes um, patterns of seasonal winds, it changes all sorts of things. So just one factor changing, the temperature, has this knock-on effect on all of the planet's weather and its overall climate. So what are some of those effects? Well, increased global temperatures, and that is a big problem. Um, it's a particularly big problem in uh, at the North and South Pole because the temperature will increase more there compared to other places. Um, we can see here this, this um, polar bear is starving. The reason it's starving is due to melting ice that's making it much harder for it to hunt the seals that it depends on for food. Um, but it's not only polar bears that will be affected. You know, light, there, there are very clear signs that life across the entire planet is being negatively affected by the impacts of global warming.
It means change rainfall patterns. Um, now that's a problem for the natural world and for the living world. You know, imagine you're a farmer who depends on seasonal rains. If those rains change their timing, it means your crops may not grow, and it means that you may you, you may not be able to grow your food, and it could potentially push you into starvation uh, and other other bad things. Um, melting polar ice caps, um, as well as having these knock-on effects on the poor polar bears, is uh, also causing sea levels to rise. Okay. That means that coastal communities are at much greater risk of flooding um, and it means that some areas that we can currently live in will be underwater and no longer habitable. Uh, and it means living organisms need to shift their habitats, which sounds quite straightforward, but actually is pretty difficult. You know, if, you are, um, if you are a creature living at the equator and it gets too hot there, you can move north or south. But if you're already living, say, at the bottom of South America, you can't go any further south to escape the increasing temperatures, so there's a good chance you might die out. So, given that global warming uh, and climate change is, is clearly a bad thing, what can we do to limit it? Well, the main number one thing is to reduce our production of carbon dioxide. That means using less energy. It means driving cars less. It means using renewable energy. It means eating less meat because meat is one of the biggest uh, meat production is one of the biggest sources of carbon dioxide and uh, methane and it can also mean some some sort of crazy sci-fi sounding stuff like putting giant sunshades in space to make less sun light get to the earth but those are big and expensive and difficult we don't know if we can do them so let's focus instead on what we know we can do which is reducing carbon dioxide production using more renewable energy and eating less meat Thank you for listening. The end.